My name is Lindsay Hilson. I'm the international editor of Channel 4 News. Um, as Judy says, my head's in Iran because I only just came back. But my, my, my claim to any legitimacy on uh, Mexico is that I used to live there many years ago, and I was reporting from there in November, uh, where I went to Culiacán and up onto, into Tijuana to, uh, to do a report for Channel 4 News there. Um, however, the panel here around me know much more about it than I do. So let me introduce them one by one. Ed Bulimi is, uh, I was about to say veteran correspondent, but we hate that phrase, don't we, Ed? We really hate it. And so he, a very experienced uh, correspondent, very famous for his uh, reporting from the former Yugoslavia, and uh, the author of a forthcoming book called A Mexica, or am I supposed to call it A Mexica? Um, which is fine. Mexico is fine. Um, it's spent quite a lot of time in, in the last couple of years reporting from that border area and um, in Mexico itself. And uh, Nadine Jurat is from the Rory Peck Trust, and she'll be talking a bit about journalists in Mexico because Mexico has become one of the most dangerous places for reporters in the whole world. It really is an extremely difficult place to do journalism. Uh, particularly for Mexican journalists. And Tom Porteous from Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch has recently uh, done a report about abuses by the military, which raises all sorts of interesting issues about the, the military being needed to try and do something about the rampant criminality of the narco wars, and yet how are they using that? What are, what are the methods they, they are using in that? And I'm sure in the audience, um, I expect we've got expertise as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask all three of our speakers. We are also hoping to have um, Alex um, Twiddle, who's not here yet, who made the film uh, Juarez, City of Dreams. But he, he hasn't arrived yet, but hopefully he will arrive later. So I'm going to ask each of our participants to just give a, a short presentation. And then I'll probably ask them a few questions and then uh, throw it open. So Ed, let me... Let me uh, open it to you first. You've been going backwards and forwards to Mexico for a long time and to the, the border areas. Can you just paint a picture for us of what it's, what it's like living in this what has become a narco state? Um, <clears throat> well, I think the, the border area one can rightly call a narco state. Mexico itself not in as much as Guinea-Bissau is, Colombia <laughs> keeps being on the brink of one. Um, uh, I mean, what it's like there, I mean, I'm presuming that most of you who have been here haven't got some idea. Um, I don't want this thing just to be one great sort of policy wonkathon. Um, you know, these, this border area and these places, they are charismatic. They are um, exciting. I mean, it was always said that the Spanish were sort of simultaneously repelled and compelled. Um, and the, there is a sort of a compulsion as well as a repulsion in these places. They are charismatic cities. Juarez is probably one of the most charismatic cities in the world, but nowadays for all the wrong, or many of the wrong reasons. Um, um, but, but yeah, you know, the cliches almost work. You know, these are places where the colors are very bright and the shadows are very, very dark. The, the, the um, dichotomies are are very cogent. The border is harsh in as much as it's a great fence being built, and it's porous in as much as they want as much traffic and train trucks to roll across that border as possible, um, but as few people and as little drugs as possible. Um, I will talk later, if, uh, but not maybe part of the opening remarks, about um, what they call the Iron River, which is the, you know, while the drugs go in one direction northwards, the guns come south. And until quite recently, that was almost a taboo. Um, so that's the sort of place it is. Um, uh, I think it's, it's um, in this discussion, I mean, as a backdrop to it all, in, in, in the book I'm trying to write, there's something about us as well as about there. And I don't mean us in this room, I mean us as a society. It, there is a consciousness of the fact that we now live in this world where coffee chains compete for the sort of, you know, the most ethically grown frappuccino and, uh, and, and the sort of the number of happy, smiling African people that grew your, your Morge to peas is almost a mainstream supermarket um, sort of discourse. But cocaine is completely immune from this, 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 uh, this discussion. It's still either celebrity tittle-tattle or it's sort of Nancy Reagan 
fighting the war on drugs, which four decades later doesn't seem to have even started, yet alone finished or been won or lost. Um, uh, w without wanting to sound like the Christian coalition, because I share very few of their views, <laughs> if any, um, you know, no one really, we haven't got to this how many lives just went up your nose uh, in, in, from Latin America, from Guinea-Bissau, from wherever. Cocaine has a strange, and, and, and what I'm trying to do with, with, with this book is to sort of, what I'm calling it is a sort of, you know, backstage pass access all areas to, to the glittering cocaine night or the sun's front page on Cape Moss. Um, I, I mean, I don't, we don't have time in opening remarks to go through the history of how we got here. But in a nutshell, and those of you who do know the story will find this you know, very Jack and Jill, but, but um, uh, Mexico was, was, was for, for, many, for a long time, made mostly a producer of heroin, Mexican mud heroin, and a transit for Colombian cocaine through to the United States. Um, uh, which it inherited when the Caribbean routes got 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 uh, got blocked. Uh, the United States did that. They also did another thing. Um, got involved in Iran Contra, which is um, uh, another story, but significant in as much as it, it it created what was called the Mexican trampoline, whereby the 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 the, the, the corridor, the the transit country, came to you know the middleman came to hold as much power, and eventually now I think even more power than the Colombian suppliers themselves. Um, and we can see now uh, the, the, the big Mexican cartels spreading their influence all over the United States and all over Latin America as well, in as much as a crystal meth bus near Buenos Aires recently uh, turned out, I think, 25 arrests, 18 of whom were Mexicans. Um, uh, what, what happened in a nutshell, and I, I, I won't have time to go through this in detail, but can if you want to know, is that when uh, the kingpin drug lord um, Felix Gallardo was arrested, a sort of monopoly started to break up. Um, uh, he was the man who engineered this situation whereby the cartels became as powerful as they, as, well, the cartels, it was, they became as powerful as it was. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> try to establish what in Italy is called a Pax Mafiosa, whereby the product keeps flowing and people try not to sort of disrupt the equilibrium between the cartels. And he basically carved up the border. To the east, the Gulf Cartel. Next to them, the Juarez Cartel, the Ciudad Juarez. Interesting bunch, bunching around Sonora, going into Arizona. There's a group called the Beltran Leva, who well, I think we will hear a lot, a lot more of uh, um, over the next year. Um, uh, an Ill, a sort of ill-defined territory for what was called the Sinaloa Cartel, which was in itself a, 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 a sort of part of a subdivision of that which controls the, the corridor to the west between Tijuana and San Diego, which is the Ariano Felix organization. Um, and in, in two things happened, and we'll go into this in more detail, especially when Tom has spoken later. Two things happened simultaneously. On the one hand, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, and I don't actually buy either the United States version or the Mexican government's version, President Calderon decided to kick the hornet's nest, if you like, and send in the Mexican army against principally the Gulf Cartel, which itself raises a whole lot of questions. Um, and the other thing that happened was that this fifth cartel, the Sinaloa, pretty much declared war on the whole frontier and, and started to claim the whole frontier. So the Pax Mafiosa was ruptured. Um, and that's where we are now. Now, there are a number of heresies that, that, that I want to sort of kick off with, um, and I'm going to cover them as quickly as possible, and we can come back. Uh, as, as we go along. Uh, number one, <clears throat> that this is a war between the upright United States and the Mexican government cracking down on the narcos. Bullshit. The narcos are integral to the economy of the border, integral to the Mexican economy and the United States economy in a number of ways, uh, which I can detail a, a, as you wish later. They are integral to the economy of the Magileros, which is the necklace of sweatshop bonded factories along the border, established whereby the US could basically have third world labor uh, 20 minutes walk away over the Rio Bravo, Rio Grande, and or the border, whichever you want to call it. Um, they are integral to NAFTA and the whole economy of the free trade across the border, because the narco is in a way a pioneer of globalization and global capitalism. I mean, the narco, uh, the Camorra of Napoli were into China um, with textiles a long time before Coca-Cola got anywhere near uh, uh, post-communist China. They were into Eastern Europe 
within minutes of the Berlin Wall going down, um, acquiring <laughs> Kalashnikovs and selling them to Africa, uh, while Bill Gates was still sort of wondering where Eastern Europe was. Um, and similarly, in, in, in Mexico, the narco is NAFTA long before NAFTA. The narco is, is, the, is, the, is the great free trader. He, he is the narco sans frontières. Um, and uh, and you know, if you take the narco out of this, the economy of the border, the economy of the border collapses. Um, the narco is also crucial to the to the um, to the to the to the to what is called migration, or what the Americans called immigration. But in Mexican terms, this is emigration. Mexico is a country and a, and a collapsed economy, and I say collapsed not just because it collapsed, but the United States collapsed it which exports people, and it exports people because people that it exports to the US send money back. And I think after oil, uh, drugs, and tourism, it's the fourth biggest income that the country has. Um, the narco is, all, is involved in that, uh, using the same routes, using the same people, though in different ways. Um, and, and, but crucially, I think the, 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 the misapprehension, the, the final crucial misapprehension, is this the question of how the war is being reported in I mean there's estimable reporting going on and, and he's going to talk about this um, and there's some very very good American North American journalists working on it too but it's still presented as this kind of almost the, the, the cartels confronting each other rather like sort of Zhukov and the panzer divisions at the Battle of Kursk um, and it ain't like that um, to continue this, 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 this thesis of the narco as the, the metaphor of the modern global corporation, um, big corporations don't do dirty work themselves anymore. They outsource, they tender, they get other people to do it. Um, yes, the cartels will have the bent border guards, they will have the technology. They second guess and usually outguess the DEA technologically virtually every every step they make. I mean, when Boeing come to build a virtual wall somewhere in near Palomas, in a city that hardly has any running water, the narco will probably get around the virtual wall by building another tunnel or, or some other way when they get develop a, a, a way of sealing some of the 18,000 trucks that cross through Laredo every day. Uh, they work out a way of breaking the seal and resealing it so that the border guard doesn't notice. Um, but, but so the, the cartel will have that sort of operation, but the really savage violence is the outsourcing. It's between Colonia gangs, there are 500 of them in Ciudad Juarez alone, for the tender. So what we have, I think, um, and this is a hypothesis, uh, you know, I've got a, a, a rather scary rest, remainder of the year working on this, is, is a sort of grotesque um, pastiche of, if you like, the local authority putting the, the rubbish collection out to tender. Um, uh, it, it, the, what, what killed uh, t well, Estla, I don't like numbers. I'm a journalist, so I wouldn't. Would I? Um, but we're talking about ten thousand over the last um, uh, two and a half years. It's a lot of people. I mean, people say, "Oh, you're going to Mexico? What about swine flu? Well, swine flu's <laughs> killed 108, and the, and the cartels have killed ten thousand. I'm, you know, a little bit more worried about the latter. And uh, and I think there is a point to be made. It's not just the number that people are being killed; it's how they are being killed. I mean. People bore themselves to death in this club night after night, talking about how many bodies we've all seen. But, uh, and I've seen a few, as we all up here, Lindsay's seen more than anyone put together, probably. But I've never seen, you know, 13 of them piled up with their heads cut off and their fingers stuck up their asses outside a primary school, by way of suggesting that children do not talk too much. Um, uh, there is, you know, it takes imagination to work out that, uh, you know, one way to kill people if you really want to make a statement is to tie them to a chair and cut their hands off. It takes, I think, four to five days. Uh, this is sort of, this is, this is strange stuff. I mean, we live in a world, and this club exists because, unfortunately, Jews fight Arabs and Muslims fight Muslims and Serbs fight Christ. But this is Mexicans doing this to Mexicans so that America can get high. What? And then the final heresy, and I'm going to stop, really, because the, the arms coming south is no longer a heresy. America's finally woken up to the fact that no drugs, no war, no guns, nothing to fight it with. And all those guns, or 90% of them, come from Texas and Arizona. The narcos are blessed with the fact that, that over the border are, 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 the, are three of the four American states for whom the free market in guns and gun shows is part of some kind of national identity or psychosis, whichever way you look at it. The last point I want to make is that the discourse 
has all been about the impact on the United States, the, uh, uh, it, whether it be you know, the line of snow up Sharon Stone's nose that she keeps saying is such fun, or the ravages of crack on American streets. The impact on the border towns, which are now vast communities, has been catastrophic. Tijuana, Juarez, Nuevo Laredo, Reynosa, Matamoros, <coughs> Monterrey slightly less so. These are cities which are, are losing an entire generation to crack crystal meth. It, it, it's, it's, it is a disaster. Um, uh, you pay in kind. Um, uh, I've gone way over my five minutes. Since I'm going to shut up. The last point is, I think you know, if, if we're going over this sort of uh, uh, this, 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 this sort of you know, analysis behind this idea of a sort of confrontation of, of armies. Yes, there is a confrontation of cartels, to be sure. Um, and later on, we'll talk about the Mexican army and whether or not this is the Mexican state or whether they have an interest one or the other, because most police forces have an interest one or the other. And there's an awful lot of discussion going on about um, the possibility that the army is actually trying to restore the Pax Mafiosa and not to crush all the cartels, but actually, according to some recent journalism in Mexico, is actually operating on behalf of one of them, the Sinaloa. Um, uh, but I think if I wanted to add now, you know, it, it would be on this human note of this, of this catastrophe of um, re these rehab centers on the outskirts of the desert, <coughs> of the towns in the desert, Juarez and, and Reynosa, where hundreds of people um, uh, are chattering away to themselves mindlessly, horribly. <clears throat> and when they do make sense, they're telling you about the bone man who tries to get me to kill my mother. Um, uh, this, is, this is the pandemic in Mexico. It's not swine flu. It's, it's called crack cocaine and crystal meth, and it's a, it's a fucking catastrophe uh, that doesn't get written about in this uh, endless discourse about keeping America high, which is, of course, another important matter and the root of the problem. Thank you, Ed. I think you have, you have evoked for us the, the horror and the, the breadth of this and how the narco, uh, the whole idea of narco is so interwoven into all of these different structures in Mexico, in America, and increasingly in Europe. So reporting on it, Nadine, tell us a bit about what it's like for Mexican journalists um, reporting on, on what's happening to their own society, their own country? Well, Mexican journalists have been threatened, have been kidnapped. Um, there's, I think, a Mexican, I believe, phenomenon which is called Levanton, which I think is, is translated as uh, express kidnapping, where journalists get kidnapped for about 24 hours, beaten up, tortured, and told, if you ever report on this again or ever come close to me again, um, I will kill you, I will kill your family in front of you, and then we will kill you. There have been 27 journalists, at least 27 journalists killed in the last 10 years. Seven have disappeared. It's the highest number of disappeared journalists, I think, around the world in one country. And um, so this has led to a lot of self-censorship. It doesn't only happen, it used to happen only in the northern border towns and, and kind of the international journalism support community became aware of Mexico, I think in 2006, when it first was among the top five um, countries to, most dangerous countries to be a journalist. It's now, I think, number three, number two, the numbers vary, and it's very difficult, I think, to measure in general. But um, it's up there with countries like Iraq, with countries like Afghanistan, where there's a declared war. Um, it used to happen mainly in the northern border towns. It's now spread, depending on where the drug routes go, um, you have a lot of incidents also in, in Acapulco, in Guerrero, the state of Guerrero, um, <clears throat> because the different, the, the different drug cartels control these areas. So a lot of self-censorship, um, no investigation, no reporting even on traffic accidents where maybe someone of a, a relative, a distant relative of one of the drug cartels is involved. Um, we did a survey with over 300 freelance journalists in Mexico a couple of years ago when the situation was already bad, not as crucial or not as bad as now. And over 50% told us that they had been threatened um, in form of text messages, etc. That on top of that come attacks on media houses, come 
the, the murder of editors of some of the most prominent uh, northern newspapers, come attacks on, 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 on the offices of Televisa, which is not just the biggest media in Mexico, it's the biggest media conglomerate in, in the world. So they have stepped up their attacks, and um, as a result, there's only very, very few investigations. A lot of them happen from Mexico City, which is still safe, but is also now getting a bit more dangerous. Um, and a lot of journalists that we speak to feel that their newsrooms have been infiltrated by the drug cartels. They don't just control the police, who obviously they don't trust, they don't, uh, or local government, which is corrupted. But they say, we have been infiltrated. I can't trust my colleague anymore because I don't know if he will report back to the drug cartels on what I report on. So self-censorship, like I said, is the biggest problem. It is no, no longer um, a way to protect yourself either anymore because the drug cartels are now using the media as propaganda tools. In these wars between these different drug cartels that we believe is happening at the moment, um, they say, you either report on this or we will bomb your offices, your newspaper offices. So not even that protects journalists. So journalists just report on, um, you know, the newspaper in Ciudad Juarez will probably just report on the local wedding or, or, or you know. But if that wedding or that baptism is of one of the drug cartels, they won't report on that either. It, it spreads. Uh, to every aspect of life, of social life, not just the killings, not just the murders, not just the drug addicts, but, but to every part of life, really. Um, another n relatively new phenomenon is now that uh, a lot of journalists are fleeing to the United States and asking for asylum. There's no exact number how many, but we hear of more and more because they just cannot go back. They can't, they've been threatened and they don't feel they get the protection locally to be able to continue living, not even just reporting, living there. So it's been, it's been getting worse and worse and it doesn't look at the moment like it will get any better. That's a bleak picture, a very bleak picture. I'm now going to turn to Tom Porsche from Human Rights Watch. I mean, the, the picture which we've had painted here is one of complete lawlessness and uncontrolled violence. Now, the Mexican government brought the military in um, towards the end of last year. Was, was that not the right thing to do? Was that not the only way to try and get a handle on all this? Mm. Um, well, first of all, you described me as an expert on Mexico. One of the more irksome uh, parts of my job as London Director of Human Rights Watch is that I often have to act as a sort of ventriloquist dummy for our researchers who really are experts and they really know what they're talking about. And I spent, I took time off from coordinating our work on Iran this week to speak on Skype to our, the person who wrote our report, which is here, Uniform Impunity. I've got a couple of copies which I can actually leave here. And so she filled me in on, uh, on, on the report and why they wrote it and so on. Um, and I, I suppose a good question in the light of, um, uh, so I can't give, just as I, I'm not wearing such a colorful shirt as Ed, I can't give nearly as much uh, color and context to what's going on. But I can talk about the report. I mean, uh, I mean, first of all, the reason, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate question. Why focus on the abuses of the military when they pale in comparison to the abuses of the, of the, of the narcos? Uh, and, and the answer, I think, is, is, is quite straightforward. First of all, the abuses of the military are uh, not getting much attention internationally, and we think it's important. And secondly, um, you know, the narcos wouldn't listen to us, whereas the Mexican government does listen to us. They care about, about what we say. So if we're going to have any impact at all, it might, uh, you know, um, we should focus on, on, on the military's abuses. And that's not to say we don't uh, sometimes focus on abuses of non-state actors. We have done reports of abuses on both sides, for example, in, in Afghanistan, Taliban and uh, and government and the international forces. But you know, to answer your question, Lindsay, I mean, first of all, I mean, I think it's important to acknowledge that there is a major security problem in, um, in Mexico, uh, and, uh, uh, which is linked to narco-trafficking and organized crime. Uh, and as uh, Ed pointed out, there have been, not only have there been thousands of deaths, but you know, the deaths are peculiarly horrible and, and, and disgusting. And, and the Mexican state, by the way, has a responsibility to protect its civilians. Um, so, um, you know, our, our report does not in any way recommend that the uh, Mexican authorities withdraw 
uh, the military from having a role in, in, in addressing that, that, that problem. Uh, we don't actually have a position on whether the military should be involved or not, and we understand the point that the Mexican police, for a, a variety of reasons, including you know, infiltration and, and corruption and so forth, um, were, um, ha have been unable to deal with it very effectively. What we are saying in this report is that the, um, if the military is to deal with this problem effectively, then uh, they must gain the trust of the local population. Uh, in areas where it's operating. Um, uh, and in order to do that, and, and it's a, a local population that because of the security situation, because of the activities of the narcos, is particularly traumatized. And in order to do that, in order to gain the trust, there has to be proper accountability um, uh, for the abuses that any abuses, um, even a small number of abuses, but we think there are actually quite a large number of abuses that the uh, military is, is accused of being involved in. So. Um, you know, the point of our report is to, is to underline that there is no accountability under the military system of justice uh, for the simple reason that there's a, a very basic conflict of interest that the Secretary of State for Defense is responsible both for military operations and for military justice. Um, uh, and our report detail, details 17 cases that we've looked at uh, of very serious abuses. We're not talking about just minor abuses. We're talking about killings. We're talking about rape. We're talking about torture. These are not small abuses, even though it's not quite what, um, what Ed was describing <coughs> earlier. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and these 17 cases involved you know, not just 17 victims, they involved 70, uh, 70 victims. And our report showed that in those 17 cases, there was not one case of a military investigation leading to a conviction. But there was one case of a civilian uh, investigation in, in those 17, and, and, th and that civilian investigation led to four, four convictions. So there's a clear, clearly that underscores, underlines that there's a, uh, there's a real problem uh, with uh, military justice, uh, namely that, this conflict of interest that I talked about. Um, most uh, cases of abuse against uh, civilians are investigated and, and prosecuted by the military um, in a system which as far as, we, uh, as far as our analysis and the research shows, lacks basic safeguards um, to ensure transparency, independence, and impartiality. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and there's only a very limited uh, review of the military justice system uh, by, uh, uh, by the civilian system. Um, so this is obviously no way to achieve accountability, and because there is no accountability, there is impunity, and because of that, the abuses are continuing. Um, our, report is, our report came out in April, and it's actually touched a bit of a raw nerve in, in Mexico, in part because the issue of uh, military uh, impunity uh, is exactly the issue, uh, the, the, the main human rights issue that the international institutions such as the UN Human Rights Council um, are focusing on w when it comes to Mexico. There's something called the U Universal Periodic Review Process in uh, Geneva in the, uh, at the UN Human Rights Council. And this was the main recommendation of Mexico's UPR, as it's known, Universal Periodic Review. Uh, and also there are a couple of cases before the Inter-American Court on military abuses uh, by uh, the uh, Mexican military. Uh, but I think most importantly, military um, accountability is holding up currently 15% of the $1 billion uh, dollars that uh, has been pledged by the U.S. government under the Merida um, initiative to help Mexico deal with, uh, with the, uh, the, the drugs problem. Um, uh, and, and I think that's the key, that's the key thing, that's the, our key source of, le of leverage. And there are four human rights conditions which are attached to military aid, and one of them is, 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 um, civ is to have civilian investigations into the most serious abuses uh, of which, uh, in which the military are involved in. And since the, our report came out, the MOD, has, the, the Ministry of Defense in Mexico, has actually responded to the, um, the Human Rights Council uh, uh, UPR review, the Universal <coughs> Periodic <coughs> Review, um, uh, uh, by saying, well, actually, uh, we know of nine convictions that the military has, um, ha has managed to secure as a result of its investigations. But uh, it hasn't given any details whatsoever. And we've been asking for a couple of years to, for the military to give details of you know, the results of any investigations. And you know, they didn't come back to us and didn't come back to us. And eventually, someone said, oh, well, 
you know, and they always say, well, there are many convictions, but they never give any details. And then uh, eventually they gave us one, the, uh, the details of one conviction that took place in 1998, um, which is not a, a very good uh, record. Now, I mean, some people might say that given the size and severity of the problem related to drugs trafficking, you know, 17 cases involving 70 civilians is pretty small beer, not, not very important. But, you know, and, and there are people in the Mexican government who say, why is Human Rights Watch obsessed with this issue of, of, of military abuses? I mean, we think that the problem is actually much more widespread than those figures suggest. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, since, the, uh, since December 2006, when the new administration actually launched its, uh, you know, its, its military operations, uh, complaints of abuses have, have increased sixfold from 182 complaints to 1,260, which suggests that there's a bit of a problem with uh, military abuses uh, in, in relation to this war on, on the narcos. But more importantly, I would argue, and we make this argument frequently in relation to the, uh, you know, the UK and the, and the US's war on terror in various fronts of the so-called war on terror, um, it's not just a matter of principle, it's a matter of strategy. You know, the, in, in, in areas where Mexican militaries are mainly being deployed, these are areas of limited or no government uh, control, no government authority, and where the influence of the, of the criminals involved in narco-trafficking is absolutely massive. And they've infiltrated all kind of the institutions. The civilians operating in, uh, the civilians who are living in these areas actually have a very bleak sort of alternatives. Um, I mean, some people might say they don't have any alternatives at all. But uh, I mean, we suggest that uh, you know, they can actually cooperate with the military, with the government's efforts to, to deal with this thing. Um, they can also cooperate, and they are forced to cooperate, and they're sort of blackmailed into cooperating with the narcos. If the military themselves are untrustworthy because there's no accountability for the abuses that they carry out, albeit lesser abuses than those carried out by the narcos, then the Mexican government is going to lose the battle of hearts and minds to use another expression from you know, counterterrorism. And that's why we, we think it's, it, it, it's very important that these abuses should be addressed. Uh, and we hope that the pressure will now come from the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, also from the Inter-American Court, perhaps, but most importantly from, from Washington, that uh, these, uh, these abuses should be addressed and that there should be civilian, a civilian, uh, uh, pro uh, that the, the most serious abuses of torture, rape, killings and so forth should be handled by the civilian justice uh, system, which is not brilliant, but at least it's more transparent and more accountable. Thanks, Tom. That's a really interesting <coughs> angle on this whole thing. Uh, before I throw this open to the floor, I just want to say one, one thing that Ed said really interested me, and it's been something that I've been thinking about a lot since I, I went to Mexico in November, which is this issue that it's, it's socially completely unacceptable now to smoke. You can't even do it in the frontline club. And um, it's socially unacceptable to buy your mange to from, you know, um, some abusive state. And yet it is not socially unacceptable amongst the middle class and, and, and others to take cocaine. And I, I just wonder if there's, I wonder if we should be coming up with a slogan or just uh, thinking of something which tries to, um, so that people understand what this means, that it is about the cutting off of people's heads and fingers in front of a primary school. It's about this kind of extraordinary violence. It's about the oppression of, of journalists. It's about the kind of injustices and abuses of power that, that Tom has, has been describing to us, whether there's something uh, about this narco war in Mexico that we're, I, I certainly think that in Britain we're not engaging with properly because we think it, it doesn't affect us, that it's something that's happening over there. Ed, I don't know if you have any thought, further thoughts on, on that. <clears throat> I would, um, I think, yes, I sort of, at the moment, I'm, you know, when, when, when I was trying to get this thing on the map, um, as you were saying earlier, I mean, this, this, this war, it isn't a war. That's the word they use. <laughs> that's, that's Nancy Reagan's word. Um, uh, this calamity. Um, began really in, well, the, the, the fighting started in, in London in 2005. Sorry, I'm, I'm yeah, no, interrupting asking you a question. Go. The army went in in 2006, uh, in December. It didn't really hit the radar screen, I think perhaps because of recession, Obama and whatever else. 
It's a really quite recently, yeah. last autumn. Really. Um, it hit the radar screen frantically when Hillary went down and when Obama went down. It's now sort of it's gone back to page 17 again. I'm, it actually yeah. went hit the radar screen when CNN went down. So yes, when Anderson sure Cooper went, 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 stood on the border next to her friend. But, um, <laughs> no, but, but, but I mean, no, this does interest me, I, and I think it's. I mean. The, the la you know, we, we, uh, let's not go and talk about the media, <laughs> for goodness sake. Um, but um, there is a, I mean, I'm curious about this exemption of, of, of drugs from the touchy-feely consumerist lexicon, if you like. Um, you know, uh, to be honest, I mean, I, I don't take coke, but I know a lot of people who do, and I think that the fact that it is, I mean, to, to, be, to be brazen about it, Lindsay, I think, you know, w where does this lexicon come from? It comes from the people who run the arts, the people who edit newspapers, the people who run TV companies, the people who, you know, hang out at the Groucho Club and whatever they could in LA New Yorker. You know, they're the ones who disappear off into the, in the, into the bog and come out jittery and then give it a lot of that for the rest of the evening, and we know why. And, and I suspect that that's, um, that's part of the problem. Um, you know, the Labour Party can sort of bang on about drugs, but when, you know, the old Bill goes in to swab their telephones at the end of their stupid party conference, there's a covered in bloody, st like it's been snowing in the bloody hotel room. And um, so, you know, we know who they are, we know what, what they run, and um, perhaps it's just a little bit close to home. It's like sort of MPs asking, just look, look at our expenses. Or something. And I, um, but yes, I don't know, some sort of campaign. Yeah, I think it's a very, very good idea. But I think I'd rather sort of, you know, mm -hmm. just sort of, you know, put this right centre stage. And this is about Mexico. But I think this is part of a series so far as I know, isn't it, Julian? I mean, you know, once we get to West Africa, you can uh. amplify everything we're saying tonight mm. to calamitous degrees. I mean, when the stuff started washing ashore in Guinea-Bissau, the poor sods were lining out the lines on a football pitch until they realised what, the, what that stuff was coming ashore. Now they're all... Um, you know, putting it over the candles and uh, and smoking. Yeah, they've assassinated um, a, a president and a and, head and of the army. But but I think I mean didactically, yes. I mean I'm trying to sort of you know talk in a descriptive language of of of, of, the, of the of the what has happened over the years I've been going to the border. Um, but 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 if this is bound to get prescriptive. As I said, there are these heresies about what is going on that is not being reported, and this uh, exemption of drug taking um, from any kind of ethical cons consumption, literally mm -hmm. language, I think is probably down to the people who are taking it and the jobs they hold. Okay. Well, that was just, that was a slight aside. Go I mean, on, Tom. Yeah, I mean there are two. I mean there's an, there's another important issue. If you talk, talk about stigmatizing drugs. I mean, drug, this, cocaine is a class A drug. It is already stigmatizing that it's, mm. cri it's, it's a criminal offense. You can go to yes. prison for, you know, sort of possession of, you know, mm. too much of it. Um, uh, the, uh, another interesting question is, is whether legalization would actually kind oh. of <laughs> deal with the problem better than stigmatizing it further than it's stigmatized already. Um, I mean, obviously, Human Rights Watch doesn't have a position on that. But, sure. uh, you know, I think that's a question that is not asked yeah. Significant, uh, often enough, mm. precisely because the, the drugs is so stigmatized. It's, it's all this moral kind of fervor about it, and all the sort of tabloids. And uh, I, I think that's a much more interesting question. Yeah, the question of legal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's because then it would take it out of the hands of these yeah. of, the, of these of these criminal cartels, and uh, could be controlled, and you know you wouldn't have the violence at, at source or and, yeah. uh, and along the way in Guinea Bissau or on the border yeah. of Mexico. That's, that's also a very good point. OK, let me throw it open to anybody who wishes to ask any of our panellists about this. Yes, Lady in the Pink, there. Hi. Uh, there's a microphone coming round to you. Yeah. Um, I, was a, I was a journalist in Mexico for TV Azteca, so, you know, the points you were saying were exactly right. true. I think, as a journalist trying to do a report, you know, I was faced with things where, you know, it's like signing your death sentence if you, if you want to try and do a report. Um, I'm on, you know, anything to do with the drug cartels. And it's sort of leading on from, from the point about, you know, I was going to ask exactly that. You know, it sounds extreme, something like legalization, but what I think something extreme is needed to change the situation. And I wanted to know what your opinions were on, on what could be done. And, you know, instead of just America sending money or sending whatever to Mexico, kind yeah. of looking at themselves, because, like you're saying, if there's no demand, then, <laughs> you know, there's yeah. no need for the supply. But what, what the governments could do, you know, whether it's Mexico, whether it's America, whether it's an international organization, you know, obviously needs something really extreme, what you think 
are effective measures that could be taken to, to try and address this problem. Okay. Um, Ed, do you have any, do you have any, you cataloguer of the catastrophe, do you yeah. have any, any solutions? Um, I mean, I mean, extremely tentative ones, I'm, I'm afraid to say. Where, where were you working, by the way, sorry? I was in Cancun, so, yeah, I mean... Yeah, no, 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 it's exactly bad what, enough. Exactly mm. what you're saying. It was, Gulf, you know, the was Zetas country, mm. very And are you Mexican? I'm half Mexican, I'm half yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But this having been studied in England all my life, I was quite naive when I got there and quickly realised that <laughs> you shut yeah. up and you don't see those reports. <laughs> This, the other Cancun, but it isn't in yeah. the brochures. Um, yeah. uh, well, just to be brief, I, um, I'm very cautious about prescriptions, mm. and I'm, I'm also very cautious about legalisation. Actually, I think uh, yes, there are um, there are uh, you know ev almost every decent cop and every good prosecutor, you know, the straight ones who you know. There's one marvellous guy in Tijuana called, called uh, Morales who yeah. mm -hmm. trained with Falcone in Sicily. Brilliant. He is uh, an anti-prohibitionist, and as much he just says, "Look, you know, let the gringos get high, and we can live in peace." Basta. Um, but the problem with that is, it, um, you know, I think there's a sort of, I mean, that's okay. if you think if you're a prosecutor or a straight cop, you have the right to argue with that. But I think there's a sort of slight liberal nostalgia over what that really means. I mean, crystal meth on sale in Walmart um, and crack in boots, um, I think presumes that, uh, let's, let's not talk about the digital society and the quick hit, quick fix, quick reward, you know, you know, I, I can see my kids going down and, and enjoying it and spending their pocket money on something that's cheaper than a, you know, than a vodka pop. Um, and I think, I think there's a sort of, I, I'm not sure that the, the way that the other things in society that we, that we don't have time to talk about tonight are going in terms of addiction to computer games, quick, quick, you know, the cacophony is really a society that's ready to legalize crack, crystal meth, and agua celeste, I, I, cause, because I think kids will go out and buy it on a massive scale, and I think that will be a calamity. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I don't actually go with the sort of, with, with the obvious trendy road with that. Um, on the other hand, I do think that um, in, a, in a very patronizing way, the Americans, the North Americans, like to think of themselves, you know, we know about drugs, we're the DEA. And you guys, you know, hey, you know, you're Muay Bien and you're on the front line. And, but when someone like Marlon uh, uh, um, well, in Tijuana says, well, you know, our, you know, he talks to the Swedes, he talks to the Dutch about other measures that are not interdictory, or at least not, are not only interdictory. And I know it sounds a bit sort of airy-fairy, but the only prescriptions I can kind of tiptoe out with, really, is more input on what they are trying to do in places like, the, in, like Scandinavia, Eastern Europe, actually, where it's the other things than do drugs. The Americans are not quite, it's hard to persuade them to do that. Ironically, the, the Mexican anti-drug sort of movement, if you like, which, whether you like, no one likes the idea or not, is largely Christian. It's made up of priests and evangelicals and Whatever you think of them, you know that's who. That's they, they're the people who are standing up to the narco. They're talking actually a very modern and progressive language on drug treatment, which is not all about interdiction, but is not legalisation either. That's interesting. Now, specifically on the on the issue of the journalists, do you see the Mexican government or any other bodies in Mexico trying to do something about this? Is there any protection? Is there anywhere for a journalist to go? I think uh, there have been. Well, there is a general problem with obviously corruption that we probably mm. all know, which you know then leads to impunity um, that Tom was also talking about. And the problem really is in Mexico at the at the local level and at the federal level. Um, once you get to the national level, there have been efforts. There have been efforts to um, federalize crimes against journalists, so they will not be tried in the local in Michoacan or in in Ciudad mm. Juarez, but by um, a federal prosecutor, and they have all failed for various reasons, Some, partly because the drug cartels just have too much influence, partly because other issues like the nationalization or, or denationalization, privatization of the oil um, just became too difficult. There are now elections there, so the, the local journalists actually don't believe it's going to go anywhere. So there's not 
there are not many places, there's nowhere really to go for, for mm. these journalists. Um, a lot of them are looking to Colombia, trying to learn from Colombia. The Colombian government has a journalist protection program, which is better than nothing. It works to a certain extent, but um, it's very, very slow, and uh, we're not really sure where this will go and if it can be as effective as it is in Colombia. I think on a very short term or very direct practical way is to make journalists aware of these of other journalists in the country aware of these dangers, make media houses aware of what they can do, very practical measures, um, how to protect their journalists, to have a 24-hour hotline. Mm -hmm. The Roy Peck Trust has been working with freelancers, trying to equip them with very basic skills that, that you or any UK reporter has, doing a safety plan, preparing yourself, um, not repeating the language of the narco traffickers, but you know, being objective. There's a whole set of skills that you can teach these journalists um, in order to protect themselves. But I think in the much longer run, and what is missing, maybe not so much in the north, but in the rest of the country, is public awareness of what is going on in that part of Mexico and in those drug control yeah. parts of Mexico and the importance of independent journalism for a democracy, which I think unless the, the public, there's a public outcry when a journalist gets killed, nothing will happen, so. Okay, more questions, yes, um, a lot more questions. So we're gonna go to the lady in the back in the, yes, that lady there, yes. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think you got a point there saying that when a journalist gets killed, people should go out. But you know, the narcos don't care even if people go out, you know, and so I think that's my point. Mm -hmm. And another thing I was just uh, wondering what your views are in respect. Um, when Felipe Calderon uh, got to power, <coughs> the whole situation just uh, started getting even worse than it was with, with the previous president, which makes me believe somehow that the president just get some kind of legitimization of power by uh, just handing this uh, uh, war against narcos kind of thing. I don't know, it's just probably conspiracy, mm. conspiracy theory kind of, I don't know. Right, so do you, well, you're saying that you're asking whether by taking on this war with adopting their language against the narcos, whether Felipe Calderon did that, what, to legitimize his own presidency, is that what you're saying? Yeah, probably, I don't know, because you know, everything has started getting worse once he took power. Yes. And well, let, let me put that, that to Ed. He, he kicked the hornet's nest. The, yeah. the pre, the previous, uh, in previously, Mexican governments had had an accommodation with all these different um, groups. Um, was the impact of kicking the hornet's nest has has been what we see the violence we see today. But was that the wrong thing to do? Well, I think it's a very tough call, and you you know you you raise the <coughs> you know the, the, the point at which one. It, it, I, I never know what Hobson's choice actually was, but it, it's, it's, it's the choice between the devil and the deep blue sea. I mean, the pre, as you suggest, had, and as you say, had governed in a state of, at best, conviviality, at worst, connivance with the cartels. For, yeah, for about the previous government was, was also pan, from the PAN. Was yeah, sorry. Right. So yeah. The, the yeah. two, let's say that the long term the government, the PRI, for those who know, and then the one which followed the PAN, and now we have a, a new party. I mean, when, when some of these are. Uh, you know, academics in El Paso talk about Vicente Fox. Vicente Fox would, you know, would go, went to total war with the narcos. I mean, this is patently absurd in, in, mm. in the north because uh, Pan is as cosy with the narcos as the pre ever was in 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 the, in the south in the middle of Jordan. But I think, I mean, if we're to take President Calderon at his word, and that's a very big if, um, you know, which is the worst? Is is it is it? And this is, you know, a question that I, 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 are you, are you Mexican? You, yeah. I mean, you know, it's something that, you know, it's a burning question for any Mexican who cares about the future of the country. Do we want to live with the PRI and its accommodation of and governance with the, 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 the narco kingdom, or do we? Um, I, sorry, I said kick the horn. It's yeah. I don't know. Do we? Do we just throw the army into this situation? Um, and, and and throw the frontier up for grabs, so that Guzman can say, right, I'll have the lot, and Ariano can, brothers can say, no, you don't, and the Gulf say, no, well, and, and then it's Zetas, and then it's Los Negros, and, and if that's take, if we're taking Calderon at his word, if we're not, 
and listening to the word on the street, and that's always a dangerous thing to do, but you know, that's, there are theories. Um, and I, I am not, I, I, I can't prove it, I'm not unconvinced either by, or, or I'm not unconvinced by the theory that this is an attempt to restore this Pax Mafiosa that the PRI had, only it's gone completely wrong. It's now out of control. So you think the Calderon may not be sincere? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, and people haven't come a long way you know, on a warm night mm. to hear people up here say, I don't know, but I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think anybody right. knows. Uh, I think Shorty Guzman probably knows, and I think... Um, yeah, well, we haven't been able to speak to him for a the while. The DEA <laughs> probably knows, but uh, uh, I have no idea. I mean, in a way, the people who ever wrote the report for Human mm. Rights Watch are going to know, but, but it's, it, on the surface of it, he decided to end the coexistence of and mm. the conviviality between the Mexican government and the cartels. Um, and he decided to end that and move against them. Whether behind that, I mean, as you know, you never quite know where the bottom is in Mexico, and I don't say that as an arrogant Brit, because you don't either here, for God's sake. I mean, we're in war in Iraq, you're not. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, who knows what's going on? Um, yeah. Well, Guzman was released from jail just before he was due to be extradited from the United States. You don't do that without an inside job at the very, very top. And the word on the street is that Calderon is the Sinaloa cartel trying to restore the Pax Mafiosa. Do I know if that's true or not? I have no idea. More questions? Um, let me go to the lady in red over there and then we'll come over here. Thanks. It, it's more of a comment than a question yes, for Tom from Human Rights Watch. Just to say that I, um, I think it is a human rights issue, what, what some of the others have raised about why isn't there more of an ethical awareness campaign for consumers here in the West about how much you're contributing to human rights abuses overseas when you take cocaine. Um, and you know, similar to blood diamonds, blood cocaine, yeah. I think the points could be made very strongly about how you're propping up these cartels that have a terribly damaging effect on governance and the rule of law, fund civil wars, in addition to all the individual uh, violence and, and killing that goes all the way down the supply chain. <laughs> so I, I really would support that being a human rights issue to be taken up by, by you. OK, thanks so much. I'm going to move on. Um, the lady in the black here. Yeah. Uh, that's me? Yes, that's you. <laughs> it's kind of a comment in the, in the sure, same sense as she was saying that um, just today the U United Nations Office for Drug and Crime have released uh, their report, the annual report on drugs. And the consumption just increases and increases. And we have uh, such a huge demand that appealings, uh, I don't think it's feasible for you to say that, okay, if you don't consume drugs, um, you, you're gonna save a life. It's kind of, it's, uh, it's super idealistical, but it's not quite feasible. And uh, at the same time, we have been taking the prohibition for granted for 100 years when, when Britain were fighting a war for trading opium just 50 years before it. So I think we should, uh, I, I like that Tom said that it, it's not being taken as a serious alternative right. to, drug, to drug traffic to think about how can we regulate it, how can we take taxes from it, how can we use the money that we have been using in imprisonments to harm reduction policies and to education. And it's a long process to get there, so if we don't start looking for it now, I don't know, uh, I really don't think that it's, it, it's feasible to just mm -hmm. raise awareness about, you, I, I mean, it's interesting yeah. as, a, as an educational process for further yeah. maybe legalization as a Yeah, as a okay, woman. that's a very good point, thank you. Yeah. Yes, you. Yes, Tom, you want to say yeah. something? Go I ahead. Mean, on, on on, on your point, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I think it is a human rights issue, and we do raise, and we have done campaigns on conflict diamonds, and we've done a report on uh, gold in, in uh, the exploitation of gold in, in Congo and, and Coltan and, and so on. I, I, I agree with you. But I do think that the point about, uh, you know, and, and, you know, and, and I, sh I share Ed's concerns about, you know, 
the consequences of liberalization and maybe there'd be a massive increase of consumption, although consumption's going up anyway. The problem is we just don't know because there's not a, an open debate about it because there's so much mythology around, mm. around drugs. I mean, yes, in some circles, certainly not the circles, that, the racy circles that you move in, Lindsay, but oh, yes. uh, the circles <laughs> I move in, I don't think that cocaine is really ac acceptable. Maybe, you know, may maybe I'm just a real kind of... You've had such boring, a sad, life. sad <laughs> person. But, yeah, you know, as, 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 as I pointed out, it is criminalised, and that is, uh, uh, you know, yeah. that, that does bring its own its own stigmatisation with it. But there is no debate about it, mm. and 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 at least because of all the mythology around drugs, and I, th I think that's a pity because I think if there was a debate about it, then we would at least be able to have a clear-eyed look at you know what the consequences could be. There could be studies about it and so forth. But there's no debate about it. There's no funding into studies about it and so on. So. I'm going to keep, uh, let, uh, uh, let's also sort of try and, and relate this very directly to, to Mexico as well, which I think is important. Yes, a gentleman there in the, in the, with the blue shirt, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm, my name is Chris Coverdale. I'm very interested in uh, most wars I've come across have at least two sides to the, uh, the conflict. And I'd like to hear what is happening from the law enforcement side? Where are, are there any sparks of hope, in a sense, mm -hmm. through the law enforcement process? Uh, and perhaps anyone mm -hmm. who have got some comments about that. OK. Um, Ed, I'm going to throw it to you first. Yeah. Law yeah. enforcement. Um, yes, it, it works both ways. I mean, um, in terms, strictly in terms of law enforcement, I mean, what, it, as I get a preface, if we're taking the, the, the government at its word, and let's just do that for the sake of argument. Um, yeah, um, there are fantastic prosecutors, incredibly brave, uh, who, who are either still at it or are dead or are working th towards their death. Um, uh, th there is a dynamic, again, if we're taking Calderon at his word, that, um, and, and Tom might take issue with this, but that, that, that because the police forces and in the region are, are so compromised and corrupt, and often, um, you know, moonlighting for the, nar the narcos themselves, um, that that what Mexico is doing is federalizing and militarizing in order to um, mm. to, to to end this nightmare. Um, with, but that's a two-edged that that's a double um, problem because that creates what Tom is here to talk about. Um, but I mean. The hope is with, I mean, you have a situation like the other day. There, there was, a, there was a, a convoy taking 30 members of the, of, of the Juarez cartel on a road, police, and it was ambushed, and some police officers were killed, and some of the people escaped. But the, cop, the, the ambush was other cops working for the Beltran Leva cartel. So, but in the Sonora Police Department, there are some very good people. Uh, it is individuals, um, but th this may sound a bit wishy-washy. But the real hope is that, and the tr is in the tragedy of this. This is, you know, one of the most beautiful and one of the most attractive and alluring and compelling countries in the world is being destroyed by this. Uh, the real hope, actually, is in is in um, uh, uh, that that building that, con that that trust that that that, mm. that, that, that we, in a way you've all the uh, my colleagues here have talked about, and tapping that which is so wonderfully defiant about Mexico, which is not in so many other places in the world. And you know, these people, these, these decent cops, you know, th these, are, these are strong societies, actually, against all odds, against the fact that these are burgeoning cities without proper facilities because of the machilas and the speed with which they grow. Now. These are very strong societies. The family has not yet cracked. The community has not yet cracked. There's a whole thing of gender that we haven't even discussed yet, and the, and the power of women within these communities. You know, that's how it will be. If, it, if it's going to be one, that's how it will be one. It will be these individuals building up and working with these enormous strengths in Mexican society, which are far stronger than in the United States or most European countries. Can, can I interrupt with a question which, which goes on from, from what you were saying, uh, Chris, and from what Tom was saying. When I was in Mexico in November, um, I was in Tijuana, and they were saying there that they, people were saying that they welcomed the military as being less corrupt than the police interestingly, and that they felt that the military would be, because they were federal and they weren't sort of local and in the, in the pockets of the, of the local narcos, that they could do more about it. Is that a myth? 
No, it's not a myth, it's true, but carries with it everything that Tom has yeah. said, none right. of which I dispute. Yeah, um, yeah no, I mean, I don't take issue with, mm. with, with what you say at all. I mean, there's always a danger when a military in any country takes over policing um, functions. Uh, 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 but in this case, it's probably justified because of the corruption of the, mm. of the police, because the police has been compromised, albeit with the caveat that there are some very good policemen out there do, yeah, trying to sure. do their work. Yeah. There always are. Um, but, um, but the important thing is that the military has to do it right. And, and, that, and, and that means that you know, when there are reports and allegations and accusations of, of military abuses, those have to be properly investigated and they have to be followed up with convictions and the process has to be transparent. And the problem we've got at the moment is that simply because of the stru structural problems within the military system of justice in, 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 in Mexico, which should be quite easy to, to resolve actually, that's not happening, and therefore, I think that the longer the military stays in, in these kinds of operations without addressing this problem of accountability, actually, they will start to lose that trust, lose yeah. that good reputation which they came in with, and, and that would be a disaster. Um, and it would contribute to the further, you know, sort of destruction of, 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 this, uh, of, of this part of Mexico. Okay, more questions. Um, yes, lady over there on the left, and then I'll come to you. Yeah. I'm wondering um, what role the U.S. media plays in all of this. Um, it strikes me that for a long time they've been very preoccupied with the war on terror. And um, now with the sort of meltdown of many media companies and the, you know, uh, not as many journalists working and not as much space in the newspaper and that sort of thing. In addition, the fact that their readers often think things like crystal meth is a homegrown problem, people are cooking it in the back garden, people that are doing crack are the same people that I go to work with every day on the subway, that sort of thing. So I'm wondering how much oxygen there actually is in the U.S. for this and what um, role that plays uh, in suppression. Do, are you talking about the quality of the American media reporting or were the... I'm or talking about whether it's happening at all. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I would imagine that you wouldn't read a whole bit much about it in the Boise Gazette or the Boston Globe, probably more in the Brownsville Daily Monitor, whatever yeah. kind of it is there. But. Okay, yeah, let me... Um, Ed, do you want to comment on that? Or do yeah, you none over to you, but I'm actually <laughs> oddly interested in enough. Yeah. Uh, you know, everybody likes to blame everything on America, I mean, the United States. I mean, the, the reporting has been fantastic. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, the LA just, the, the LA, the, Times not to, LA Times is closing down pretty much every bureau it's got, but it's doubled Mexico City. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know, if you the New York Times, Mark yeah. Lacey, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, you know, this is, it's as good as it gets, actually. And you mentioned the local papers, they're excellent. They're really, really good. I mean, um, you know, these the sort of the Calexico, <laughs> whatever it is, is actually taking on the narcos, the great British teams. I, was in that, I think maybe, you know, mm. we, we have this endless refrain, will the violence cross the border, which it, it has a bit, but not as, I mean, you know, given, <laughs> given how many people cross it every day, it's, it's been fairly, it has the line, you know, is there. But maybe this will change. Maybe it'll become more dangerous to work for the Brownsville, whatever it is. Do you have any sign of that? Is there any sign of international journalists or American <coughs> journalists being being targeted, or is it really the Mexicans? Well, it was the one Bradley Will, who was uh, an American journalist, who was killed in 2006 in Oaxaca, which was not related to to the drug uh, crime, but still related to um, violence and 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 corruption, and 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 it's still going on. That was a point, and also he filmed his own killing. His camera was still running while he was shot. Um, I think there was a bit of an outcry there. There was a bit of media focus um, on Mexico, but then it very quickly disappeared. Um, I think also mainly because the American administration turned its back on Mexico, and now with Obama and Hillary Clinton revisiting the situation, realizing how much it has or will influence their own territories, um, I think there's more much more um, coverage of Mexico, some of it better than other, you know, as, mm. as always. But uh, as you mentioned, when Anderson Cooper went to, went to Mexico, went to Tijuana, went to Mexico City, that's when all of a sudden there was a bit more of an outcry. So I do believe you said that public opinion won't stop the narcos. I still think that public opinion um, can have an influence on policy makers and, you know, and, and just the awareness that if you kill a journalist, you kill, you kill a source of information. 
you know, you might, you will not find out what's going on in your neighborhood. You will not be able to 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 um, be a, a citizen of a democratic country and to exercise your rights, your human rights. So. And I think it has to work on both ways. It has to work on the American side, on the U.S. side, and it has to work on the Mexican side. Okay, we've got time for a few more questions. Yes, lady in the front, you were. Is that working? Is that working? Yes, it is. Um, just a couple but you have to point it at your mouth. Yeah, I know. Just a couple of questions. I mean, yes. things I wanted to say. Uh, the, um, the role of the United States politically, um, as you probably everybody knows, they have this habit of decertifying people once a year through, the, through Congress on this question of you know, what money they get. I think probably there's, I haven't noticed that they are doing anything particular about Mexico in that respect. I, I think it's, it's obvious, I mean, it, it's a major problem for the United States. Um, the United I'm States. I'm not sure what decertifying is. Explain it. It's new oh, well, decertifying is basically if you haven't complied with U.S. law as a, as as it relates to drug enforcement in your country, they can withhold uh, U.S. funds because right. Congress okay. allocate funds to countries for drug control and okay. different matters, so they can withdraw foreign funding basically. <coughs> Okay. And that's an annual review, and it covers all countries that are involved in the drug trade. Uh, secondly, the Americans have had a tendency to encourage countries to use the military in the war on drugs, quote unquote. Um, we've seen that in Colombia, to a lesser extent in Bolivia, because the Bolivians resisted it very strongly. Uh, I think as a new issue, which would be quite interesting to ask, is the effect this is having on the United States itself with the increased activity of gangs within US, major US cities, mm. trafficking drugs, trafficking weapons. Um, that, I think, is, is another issue that is very important and directly relates to, to the situation in Mexico. Thank yeah, you. I'm going to put both those to, to Ed, actually. Yeah. The, what is the situation on aid to Mexico on this, and also the involvement of the, the gangs, how the gangs Gangs in America relate to the to the cartel. Yeah. I mean, in the first Good. instance, I uh, I think we're a very long way from decertifying mm -hmm. Mexico. I mean, and part of that is, is uh, you know, because there's 2,000 miles of border. Um, I think Mexico has to go a very, very long way mm -hmm. down the road that Tom has <laughs> warned us uh, about before uh, they start. Uh, categorizing them as a, you know, unfit for, for, for the aid of the kind that they see fit. Um, on the matter of gangs, now this is crucial because this, this, this dichotomy between the porous border and the harsh border, um, I mean, the border is becoming, by the week now, more and more porous in terms of gang organizations. Um, the, uh, um, I mean, what, one of those American sort of, you know, apparently very, very boring government documents that someone should take a movie option out. It's called the National Annual National Gang Assessment. I mean, it tells you what, pretty much what kind of bikes they're all riding around. I mean, I mean um, and uh, it, one of the things that the that the cartels are able to do is to um, use what is an already existing structure that's there, and it is literally as as, as banal as motorcycle clubs and. And uh, other gang affiliations, blood. I mean, it's, it's, it's not proved that the Sinaloa are using the Crips and the Gulf are using the, the, the Bloods in an already existing structure. But that kind of thing is working. There's something called Los Aztecas, um, which uh, um, there was the Juarez lot and the El Paso lot, and they didn't have much to do with each other. They are now a seamless um, uh, distribution network. At, again, to use my Thing about outsourcing at the service of whoever, um, it's up to the big guys to to recruit the people who know what they're doing across that border. Um, it's it's almost like a sort of um, like 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 a dry drainage system ready to have water poured into it. Um, it's there and it's working. Um, there was a recent report on Ohio um, and how. Uh, you know, fairly sort of sporadic gang, drug distribution gangs and 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 in you know, crack houses in, in Ohio have been taken over by by the uh, and one doesn't want to say sort of the Mexicans as though you know the sort of the wetbacks are coming, but I mean just is a, a fact that 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 the um, that these gangs are being uh, 
paid very good money to distribute the stuff on behalf of the cartels. And a, a subclause of that is um, the deportation figures have gone up enormously. I mean, more and more people are getting deported. More people are coming back because of the economy. Um, now, of all those people who get dumped at the border in that compound, yeah, 90, 90 something percent are decent folk who got caught because they maybe don't understand that you can't drink a few beers and drive or you, their rear light wasn't working. But within that lot are a very, very important group of people who know the gangs, speak English, are well connected in LA and Chicago, and there's a tap on the shoulder and there's a job for them just like that with good money. And, and, and that's again how the gang, uh, uh, the gang organization crosses the border and is doing so you know, very fast indeed. Okay, well, we need to draw it to a close very soon, but we'll take a few more questions. Yes, gentlemen at the front, and then. Yeah. Um, hello, you hear about um, all these ballads which sort of extol the virtues of the um, cartel leaders um, and sort of stories about how um, people would, uh, th these, these bosses would go into a, a restaurant, shut everything down, take everyone's mobile phones, um, and then eat, eat leisurely and pay for everyone at the end. Um, to what degree are these guys heroes and what, yeah. to what degree do 14-year-old kids want to become a drug leader? Good question. The, the narco corridas, the, the songs of praise and of the great epics of the, the drug cartels. There's another question for you, Ed. To Sorry. what extent are the, yeah. are the cartel leaders heroes and yeah. role models? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, more people think that Guzman is a is a folk hero than, than think he's a vile narco. Well, no, that's that's that's, that's a stretch. Um, yeah, he, the other day he, he he apparently apparently according to a song, came into a restaurant in Nuevo Laredo and uh, locked the doors and uh, his uh, negros came in and he paid everybody's bill and they all I heard that one in Korea and, um, in November. <laughs> and it, it, they're, they're great. I mean, there's, there's a group, there's a great one about this, uh, the guy who gets kidnapped by the Federalis and he's uh, arrested and he's on a plane and he, over, he, he realizes that the plane's about to crash into a school and he overcomes his captors and uh, goes to a hero's death by crashing the plane into a mountainside, thereby killing himself and uh, saving all the lives of little children. No, I mean, it's, um, they're very popular. But interestingly, they're, inc they're even more popular in Texas and Arizona. I mean, um, journalists can't uh, cover Danco Corridos uh, in Juarez, or they do so with great difficulty now, because if you, if you find one and get to it, you know, people say, well, how are you going to get back? Um, but you can go to them in, uh, in Arizona and Texas, where they are hugely popular. And it cuts to a much more serious and alarming point, I think, that um, um, catastrophically, these border towns have always had a naughty history. You know, it's where the Marines in San Diego go to get laid, it's where the teenagers go to get drunk, it's where, uh, you know, the Viagra is $20 and the girl is $2, and we all know that. That has stopped now because the pole dancers dance pretty much to one another and everyone's scared to go because they're going to get carjacked. But, uh, you know, but, but, but the people who are still going are uh, 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 Chicano kids and some American kids who do get a lot of money and a much better girlfriend and a, a, a prettier girlfriend and a not better for sure and, and a nicer car if they go over and work for the Gulf Cartel. There's one, there's a big trial in Laredo going on now about, about ten of them, and they've been listening to the corridors for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's no point in being sort of naive about this. It's exciting for for, for people, for some people. Sure. And it's a question of the role, role models for the kids. When, when I was in Tijuana, I interviewed a little boy who'd seen, um, he'd seen a shooting outside his school. And he, he didn't see these guys as heroes. He was full of doubts. But it's just how it affects a child's mind. He was nine years old. And I said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he said, I want to have an armor-plated car. Yeah. And there was a little pause. And he said, or maybe I'd like to be a fireman. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that was what was going on in his head. Yeah, anybody, um, Lady in the White here hasn't spoken yet. Um, I'm just wondering, do you think that um, more, more financial aid and technical assistance from the US is needed? Because I think Colombia has obviously had uh, billions under plan Colombia, and it, it did sort of hunt down and kill Pablo Escobar, and bits of the Cali cartel were dismantled. And it seems from reading the, the newspapers that Colombia seems to have got, got a bit of a grip, and, and it seems to be getting worse in, in Mexico as, and as it gets a bit better in Colombia. Is that the case? And do, do you think it's mm -hmm. a question of more American? Or is it a, or is it a balloon effect that you press the, the balloon in Colombia and it 
Yeah, it goes up to, to, to Mexico. To Mexico. Yeah, Tom, to, do you? I mean, I, obviously, uh, external assistance can help if it's delivered in the right way, but it has to be transparent. Um, the British government provides military aid to Colombia. We don't know how much it is. We don't know what units of the uh, Colombian military are getting it. We don't know what the impact of that is on the human rights situation in Colombia. What we do know is that the Colombian military and their allies, the so-called demobilized paramilitaries, who haven't actually been de demobilized, are responsible for uh, scores of trade union deaths. There are more trade unions, you, trade unions killed in Colombia every year than in the rest of the world put together. And that figure has actually been going up over the last two years, even though it got better in the previous mm -hmm. five years. The situation is actually, as far as uh, political assassinations of trade unionists and some others is concerned, that's actually getting worse. So I think the lesson is that, you know, yes, aid can help, even military aid if it's, if it's done in the right way, but it has to be transparent. In fact, the, the, U, the main reason why the UK, frankly, pr decided to give all this military, we don't know how much it is, how, this military aid to uh, Colombia was, I mean, partly because it's good training for the SAS and the, the British have a lot of uh, um, uh, commercial interest in Colombia. But the main reason, I think, was because it was going to please Bush who at the time uh, was also providing a lot of military aid to Colombia. Since the Democrats took control of Congress, the, uh, the, the, the US military aid, uh, where congr congressional control over it is much, is much stronger than it is here, parliamentary control, has been held up because of exactly because of these human rights concerns. But here, because of the wonderful transparency and accountability that we have in, in Westminster oh, yeah. at the moment, uh, it's still going ahead. So we're actually saddled with a, a, a policy from which the U.S. has kind of moved on. And I think in Mexico, you know, the British doesn't have, have this problem in Mexico, so they don't give military aid to, to Mexico. But I think that, yes, there can be, uh, it, it can do some good, but it, there needs to be accountability. And we're, we certainly welcome the fact that uh, the Americans have, have held up 15% of their $1 billion um, uh, dollars under the Merida uh, initiative. Um, because of human rights concerns, particularly over the issue of military, l lack of military accountability. And just yeah, just yeah. briefly, just, just, just to underwrite, I mean, I don't think that any amount of money, and particularly given what Thomas just said, that any amount of money can compensate to what I sort of should have put more succinctly to your important question. I mean, you know, what is going to stop this is going to be organized women who stand for everything that the narco does not in Mexican society. We haven't even discussed the Femicidio in Ciudad Juarez, which has, it hasn't stopped, but you know, touch wood. Um, it's eased up only because the women were organized, which relates to what you said about trade unions, because, and I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be sort of guavarist about this, but, but, but you know, there is a connection between the narco and the machiladores, and there is a connection between the machiladores and the organization of women. And the organization of women in the machiladores can do more against the narcos than any amount of military aid, I think. Mm. And the other is the churches, and, um, you know, the priests and the evangelicals, whatever one thinks of their beliefs, are fantastic. And I don't think any amount of money can replace what organized women and the churches could do and quite possibly will do. And, and, and in a way, that's not just a, a, a counter to the point of military aid. It's actually, it's, sorry, it is. It's not just a, an addition to it. I mean, it's actually a counter to it. it um, yeah. I mean, that sort of organization against the narcos, particularly women in the churches, it actually goes against a lot of the damage, the damage that military yeah. aid in Colombia did produce. Yeah. In fact, it's the opposite of it. Okay, I'm going to, uh, we're running over time now, but I'm going to allow a couple more. Yes, Lady in the Purple. Hi, just a quick question following on from that one. Nadine, you were talking about all the threats and all the dangers it is for the journalists, but in terms of the, on the civilian levels, you know, on the other side of hero worship, these groups of women and these churches, what threat is there from, what threat is to them from the narcos in terms of, is it just as dangerous? Is it, do you know in terms mm. of figures or if perhaps there's a bit more credibility for them or they're left alone a bit because it's yeah. their own blood, I don't it know. Was, was that the dangers for these churches and women, I don't know who, who can answer, Ed, can you answer the danger well, for the, the yeah. women in the churches? No, they, 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 they I mean, to, to, to protest against the fact that 450 young women have been abducted, mm. mutilated, violated and murdered and thrown out in the trash, uh, I don't think they actually killed anyone in Juarez. They might have done, but 
they were certainly crashing into their cars and uh, and smashing their windows and things. I mean, you know, it's considered it's considered uh, antisocial to object to that kind of thing uh, if you're a woman. Um, uh, Mahiladora ac activists are overtly threatened, um, and the narcos are have common interest both socially with the Mahiladora management and also, of course, in keeping the trucks rolling. I mean, they depend on the Mahiladora of the traffic to shift 90% of the stuff. Um, and yes, in a place that I know fairly well called Vision en Acción, um, which is outside of Ciudad Juarez, where the hospitals won't deal with crackers. They, they, they don't want to know. Uh, it is only the, the churches, um, and mostly the evangelical ones. Um, uh, they, they have been harassed and menaced, and they're asked to pay a pizza. I mean, they're asked to, you know, the, the, the pittance they get from their, their, as it were, churches over the border in the United States that support them, they pay a percentage to stay open. Okay, I'm going to do you want no, to say I just thing? wanted to just add one thing about, about women is that what I've noticed in Mexico is that the few women, or the few journalists that still do investigative work and that still ask the questions are actually female journalists. Mm. And you have the most famous one, Lydia Cacho, who won the yes. 2008 UNESCO <coughs> Press Freedom Prize. Um, but you have others that are still, that are in the, in the safety of Mexico City, but they're still there, the, the, the editor owner of SETA, a magazine, which is one of the few independent uh, magazines on the border, um, is a woman. So there is quite a lot of of, of mm -hmm. women power who I agree can 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 make a change. But they they all have protection. They all have 24-hour bodyguards. So they're risking a big deal. I think we'll leave it there with the women and the the churches as the uh, most <laughs> optimistic idea and the possibility for the for the way forward but I mean our panelists are still here and they're the kind of people that if you offer to buy them a drink they'll probably answer more questions <laughs> so um, but not cocaine but not cocaine <laughs> no, very moral. so thank you all very much uh, for coming and uh, thank you very much to our panelists thank you very much.